So what I think we want to do uh, and kick off today, um, or at least kind of signal that we're going to start shortly, is a process of engaging you, um, our partners, the wider sector, people using services, government um, and uh, local authorities, clinical commissioning groups, everybody that needs to be involved to make this vision a reality, in telling us what you think we need to be focusing on for the future to really make uh, the biggest possible difference. Are there things that we need to shift the emphasis on within our programme? Are there entirely new things that we need to be considering? Um, because this is about better lives ultimately and, and we've only scratched the surface. So we're opening this out um, effectively after today and we'll be running an exercise um, that is inviting blogs um, from people uh, and inviting engagement through social media um, to hear back from you um, about what you think, what are the top things you would absolutely definitely want to see in a new partnership agreement? If there was one line that you wanted to see spelled out in that vision or given more prominence than it has been to date, what would it be? That's the kind of process we want to kick off with a view to uh, beginning um, our fourth year uh, from April of uh, 2014 with a brand new partnership agreement, possibly with some new national partners uh, on board to reflect um, a change in scope within that. Uh, and a new work programme that really can set the direction for keeping the momentum of this change going for the next three years. So to help us with that, I've, I've asked um, three of our uh, valued board members coming at this from quite different perspectives to just give us a kind of five to ten minute run through of, um, from my perspective, with what I know about where we're up to with this journey, what do I think we really need to focus on? for the future. So that's what we're going to hear next from our three speakers. We've got um, Clinton Farkinson, who's obviously been co-chairing the day with, with Marjorie. Um, he is one of the chairs of the Think Local App Personal. Um, and he's going to give us some thoughts uh, on from uh, his perspective. Um, what does he think we need to be doing next? Um, we've then got um, Alex Fox. Uh, Alex has uh, numerous roles within, uh, within the Big Lab. Um, he's coming at this um, actually with his Care Provider Alliance hat on, as he's currently the chair of um, the Care Provider Alliance, as well as um, Chief Executive of Shared Lives Plus. So he's going to be sharing some thoughts on, from that provider perspective, from that community um, kind of uh, development perspective, what, what do you think we should be doing next? And then we've asked um, Glenn Mason, who's been a, a valued uh, board member of, of TLAP um, from the outset, um, from the Department of Health, um, to give us his perspective in terms of if this is what we, we think the national policy drive um, and priorities are, um, where would it be helpful for TDAP to, to focus its attention moving forward in the context of the care bill and other things? So that's what we're going to do. Hopefully that's going to be really interesting and engaging. I'm looking forward to hearing what people have got to say. And then we're going to open it up for the remainder of the time we have in this session to hear back from you both questions to our panel, um, but also comments on the basis of what you think we should be up to. Um, and then this is, as I said, only the start of the process. So after today, we'll be opening this out and making it a much more kind of um, engaging. Um, so there'll be further opportunities to get involved in that debate, uh, it would be my point. Um, so to kick us off, um, I'd like to uh, ask Clinton to talk us through um, his thoughts uh, in relation to where to that goes next. Okay. Um, I was asked uh, to give more information than what current things that um, TLAP are, are doing. I think their um, TLAP's vision is still worth striving for. Uh, it, it's about improving people's lives, basically, and I think everyone would uh, sign up to that. Uh, for me, one of the most uh, positive things for, from a Think Local App Personal is the involvement of people who use services, disabled people and older people and carers uh, involved in it. Uh, uh, through the National Co-Production Advisory Group. The National, uh, National Co-Production Advisory Group uh, is a strong voice, I think, with inside uh, Think Local and Personal. And, it can, uh, uh, um, and we have a seat on the uh, Think Local and Personal Board through uh, Marjorie and, uh, and myself. And we are conduits for the group. They tell us some of the, uh, the issues uh, and, and challenges and solutions to um, bring forward to uh, think local at personal board. But well, people who use services, um, we have grown uh, stronger with influence, so as uh, think local at personal. 
grown, so we have grown, uh, but also it's a chance to hear from seldomly heard voices. Um, in our workshop, uh, someone used the term harder to reach groups. You know, and I know, and I have a lot of work with uh, so called harder to reach groups, and they disagree about the term harder to reach. They're saying, we're here, it's not that we're harder to reach, we're here. It's how you engage in getting us to, to, so our voices can be heard. So that's a message that I, I would say. So um, I was asked, uh, and I came up uh, uh, the group facilitated a, uh, a, a session yesterday about this today. We came up with 8,290 you know, points. <laughs> but I was asked, I was asked to, to uh, bring that down uh, to three. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> we've uh, brought it down to three. <laughs> so here are, here are some of the things from the group and my uh, um, perspective. It's still grounded in about people. I think local and personal should be about people, it's about our aspirations, our hopes, care and support isn't just about care and support, there's a wider uh, agenda about care and support and it's about bringing some of that up. But also we should not lose focus on real personalisation, even if it is challenging in some places, you know, it's, we should welcome that and it is challenging but anything worthwhile is challenging so we should embrace that. For me T that needs to be about real personalisation, not just about numbers of people on personal budgets or statistics. You know, that doesn't really tell us anything. It doesn't tell us how we're uh, uh, looking at improving uh, people's lives, numbers and, and and personal budgets. It's about you know real life from people, how has it enabled them to have choices but I would like to see TLAC focus on the principles of independent living. It's about uh, dignity in care and support, inclusion and well-being, and of, of course, keeping the voice of the people who use services at the centre of everything that TLAC does. I use the image of the tightrope because when I hear people talk about um, personal budgets, and direct payments. I keep hearing people talk about process, you know, fact systems, eligibility, and sometimes we lose the focus about, it's about people, it's about enable me to, like I started this morning, that picture of, remember, cute, babe, child? <laughs> <laughs> but still having those aspirations and hopes, and I don't lose them, but just because I'm using uh, health and social care services. I still want to uh, live an ordinary uh, life and it's about how does everyone in this room enable that to happen. So, for, uh, for me, the tightrope, we should keep the focus on making it real. Uh, making it real is the vehicle that we can use to hear about what matters to people who use services and care, uh, carers. I want the TLAP to support an expansion of Making It Real. We have 600 um, organisations signed up to uh, Making It Real, but I would like that to be tripled, you know, uh, and I hope over the next few years that, uh, that um, we're keen to develop more good case studies because there's some great stuff happening, but one of the issues is nobody else knows about that, and it's about getting that consistency and message out there that it can be creative and, uh, and innovative, but if you don't know about it, you know, people, you know, so it's about that. So it's about how do we make that a reality? Okay. I use the image of spinning pl uh, plates. We need to be look wider than adult social care and towards the support uh, for people who need, who want to live uh, full and inclusive lives in strong communities. How do we ensure that happens? You know, everybody would say they sign up to, to this, you know. 
let's do it, not just talk about it, just let's do it. We would like to see more joined up work around personalisation. We need to build on links between personalisation and the wider uh, welfare reform uh, agenda that's going up. Um, we also need to focus on embedding, like I said, the principles uh, of independent living and a reference to what's going on in uh, independent living fund, what that has uh, um, for people with disability. What does that do for us? How do we ensure that we can uh, uh, live a full inclusive life? Understanding the fair access to care, eligibility, you know, for us, you know, that's still jargon, you know, uh, and it's about, you know, how to ensure that well-being and inclusion is part of that, but telling people what that actually means with all your support plans and, and, and everything, do it with us, so, you know, keep that at the forefront. Um, when we talk about choice and control, Understanding the importance of housing, because housing has a massive issue to play in you know care and support. You know, so we would see, like to see some good case studies of how that's been done to enable people to live in their own homes. Also, um, we need to talk about bedroom tax. That has a, a you know that's the elephant in the room. We need to acknowledge that that's a, that's an issue to, to people. But also, someone who is, uh, I'm also a member of Health Watch, and I'm also keen to see closer links between social care and, and health, but, and housing, and what uh, clinical commissioning groups are going to do, because it's really important that the community understand their role and, um, and how they can facilitate our, uh, our lives and living an ordinary life. Okay. And I just thought I'd end with. Salvador, a darling, <laughs> elephants and swans. And uh, I'll leave you with this. Now you see, now you don't. Personalisation can be strange like that. When it works, yeah. it, uh, when it works, it, 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 it's invisible. But when it fa falls apart, you can really see the impact. Personalisation is everywhere, nowhere, unavoidable or hidden. What you see and how you see depends, and it depends, like most things, on who you are, your personal experience, and the people you know. So let's keep personalisation consistent. Okay, I, I said we'd have uh, two more perspectives. The next is from uh, Alex Fox. Slightly uh, gutted to be trying to follow that. Um, I'm, I was asked to speak from the perspective of um, care providers. And I hope you are going to hear me say some of the, the same things that you've heard Clinton say, because as the 11 now organisations which represent independent social care, we see ourselves as being about those services, representing those services which are trying to develop support and interventions that people actually want and that are good, quality, safe um, and achieve real outcomes. So. The challenges, I think, for, for Think Local Act Personal, where I think our, our agenda is in the, um, the provider um, sector, is that there's lots of talk about personalisation. There's been success in getting personalisation into the water supply in terms of it being the thing that everybody feels they should at least talk about. But um, one of the many reasons I, I love the making, making it real as the kind of the guiding product for Think Local Act Personal is that that is the real challenge. How do we make it real? <coughs> So, from a provider perspective, um, we need not just people to be in, in, in control of the money, they need to actually have a real choice um, of really good and really tailor, tailored services um, to spend that money on. There's no point in outsourcing the decision making processes or the, the management of care to people if they essentially find that's all that's happened. It's a, a new responsibility um, with none of the, the choice. So we need that genuine choice and market building. And that has to be for people who, um, uh, not just for people who can speak up for themselves or have people around them who can help them speak up, but for those who are least able um, to get their voices heard. And I think in some areas we can see that advocacy, brokerage are becoming really worrying and scarce now. So those choice processes have to feel easy. Um, people will second for, settle for second best if um, achieving the service of their choice feels like wading through treacle. 
And I think that means that the challenge for us as providers, but also for, for commissioners and for everybody involved in social care is that I don't think many of us go into this sector to construct services of support which just um, maintain people on a survival level, which just keep the bare minimum going. We need to be moving towards the kinds of um, support approaches which feel like they've got a fo future focus. In other words, which don't just help people survive or cope with the, the challenge or problem they have today, but which actually are, are helping people to, to plan ahead and to start to move towards um, a better life tomorrow. And understanding outcomes in that context is then a real challenge. We don't, as a, as a sector, have a good culture yet of outcome measuring. Um, we were talking about all the evidence that's actually out there in the, the previous session I was involved in on um, health and wellbeing boards and community capacity. Um, there is evidence out there, but we don't have that consistency yet around some of those most important outcomes which have traditionally been seen as, as hardest to measure and therefore hardest to, to buy, hardest to commission for. So we need to move from cheap to good. And actually, if we do that, we still won't be there because um, you can have a great service, you can have a brilliantly tailored, um, well-funded service and still be living a miserable life. We'll all be able to think of people for whom that's true because they're still isolated. Um, it's the, the older person who says, I feel useless, I don't feel like I've got a role, I don't feel like I've got something, uh, a place where I can contribute, for instance. Um, the person with a learning disability who's got great support during the day but can't get a job. So, if we're going to move from a good service to a good life, that's got to broaden out, and this is a huge challenge for TLAP, and you can see, see in the, the membership and the participation, it just started to happen as we move beyond social care, um, as we start engaging with health, um, as we hopefully move beyond the, uh, the um, inevitable point in every social care conversation where somebody says, where's housing? Um, we need housing to be there um, uh, you know, in those conversations. Then actually we need to move beyond services or beyond things that, that are traditionally seen as social care services. So that means we need people to be involved in decisions not just about their own lives and their own care, but actually um, to be involved in decisions at every level. Um, decisions about um, what happens at the whole area. We need to be um, ensuring that that's a real voice, that people um, that, that, that the concept of user-led organisations isn't just restricted to um, uh, voice work and advocacy work, important though that is, but actually we're seeing genuinely citizen-owned um, service provision, people leading and, and taking and having a real ownership stake in providers and other organisations. And that's going to mean as well developing some of the, the things we've heard a bit about in some of the sessions today, like time banking, um, like uh, community development, like lo er local area coordination, which are non-service interventions which need to sit alongside the services, the support services that people need. And also the new kinds of approaches, um, and we would class our own work, uh, Shared Lives Plus with Shared Life Services for instance, um, where the, the support is designed around people's relationships and networks and families rather than expecting things to be the other way around. And if we can do that, we'll start to move towards what I would describe as a network model of care, in which the work of providers um, feels much more aligned, much more designed around people's lives, but not just people as individuals as if they exist in isolation, but actually people as active members of families and communities. And part of that is recognising the huge role of unpaid family carers, for instance, who have always provided more social care um, than the state will ever do. We know some areas are stuck. I've been, as I've been sort of trying to set out that vision, it feels both achievable but also a very long way from some of the things that we hear from providers and from, from citizens about life out there. We know there are areas which are stuck, which, which have the same or a narrowing range of, of providers, the same old gift model services, where there isn't the support to, to have choice and to raise your voice. Um, and where those gaps between people who are able to, to assert their, their choices and people who aren't seem to be widening. Where actually the bureaucracy seems to be increasing as people get more and more desperate to guard scarce resources. Um, we hear constantly from providers who say, I'm expected to, to be excellent, but actually the price um, that the, uh, the procurement uh, department is willing to pay won't even pay minimum wage. And we're seeing areas where people are experiencing um, across the board, um, cuts in their individual resources which don't feel like they're an individually decided um, process. So there's some huge challenges there. So what does TLAP does do about that? It's got to get those stuck areas unstuck, 
it's got to get behind the areas which are taking the risks and which are achieving. And it's got to do that by putting uh, people um, and what people want and what the lives that people want to live at the centre of all that. So we've got to make the duties in the bill real. I'd say that the vision in the white paper um, and in the bill um, are strong. I think they are shared by most of us. We're probably one of the few sectors where people who use services, providers, commissioners, local government, national government, have a fairly shared idea of what good looks like. Um, we need to build on um, the co-production, which feels to me like it's been running through throughout that throughout this day, and which has been an increasingly strong part of Think Local at Personal's work. We need to get that co-production right. We don't all feel where we, we're, we've got that perfectly in, uh, in TLAP yet, but we need to get that right ourselves, and we need to then model um, that for the rest of the sector, um, because we know there's a long way to go there. We need to develop those approaches which feel um, as much like community development as they feel like service provision. Um, and for me, that's seen that there's, there's a shift that we're halfway through where in the, some of the early days there was an exclusive focus on changing demand. In other words, in theory, freeing up people's unmet demand by giving them control over money. What we've realised is that you need an equal focus on the supply. We need to act, actively build new kinds of provision if we want to see people making new kinds of choices. And then we need to be able to measure the success of those new kinds of provision um, in order to ensure that we can um, commission for it. Um, and that's got to be encompass all models of fair care. That can't just be about um, models like shared lives and time banking, which everybody can see have a really kind of community focus and which feel innovative. Um, actually, there is a role for every different form of care provision. And each form of care provision at the moment is, is underused or badly used in some places. So there are people living in care homes who um, I feel could live much more happily in the community. There are people in hospitals who could be much more better cared for in care homes. And there are care homes um, which are rebuilding themselves as community hubs and helping to find leadership roles for people who use their services, for instance. So there's got to feel like there's a space for, for the traditional in inverted commas as well as the innovative. So in other words, we've got to take some pretty huge risks. And we've got to do that at a time of probably unprecedented fear. Um, and that's quite a big ask. But I think that, it, that the route to doing that is to, to get serious about co-design, co-production with people who use services, with providers, alongside commissioners, central governments and sector bodies. And if we do that, we will keep focusing back on good lives. We will move away from cheap services. And we will not find any new money by doing that, that is obvious. But I think by doing that, what we will do is um, stop squandering and wasting the capabilities of citizens and families and communities out there, and that is our only, uh, our only hope for survival, and that feels like the main role for Tila. Thank you, Alex. I, I knew this was going to be good. Um, okay, so uh, now Glenn Mason uh, talking about this from a, a government um, perspective. Good afternoon, colleagues, and uh, it's a, a delight to get the opportunity to, uh, to talk to you and share a, a DH perspective, actually, just to echo Andrea's words this morning, I think TLAP is a delight to be part of actually. I spend my life in meetings, but it's one of the meetings I actually do look forward to, to going to because it's one of those meetings you think there is a product at the end of it yet a, rather than yet another another meeting. I think the other thing I want to say about TLAP at the beginning, and he's a priority that we hold on to this, is the success in TLAP becoming a movement. You can talk to anybody virtually anybody in the social care world and they have heard of TLAP and they know what it's not, what it stands for. You know, I'm involved in things like the OIDB and nobody knows what that does. <laughs> they, even the TIAS, nobody knows what that does, but everybody knows what TLAP is about. It's captured the imagination. I think we can all sign up to it. I want to finish with that because again I think there's some behaviours that are a priority to hold on to and some behaviours that we want to, to model more through the through the system. So anyway, but the um, in the right way, but um, what are the the department's priorities? On the basis that it's not long since we had a, a white paper and we're going through Parliament um, with a care and support bill at the moment. I hope you won't be surprised. I hope you'll be pleased to say we didn't have some new priorities in the shower this morning, that the priorities that we had in the white paper, and again thanks to TLAP for their part in 
developed in the white paper and the engagement exercise and the, the priorities that we have in the, uh, in the care and support bill are the priorities of the department going, going forward. So just really to, to remind you what that, what that vision says, and I think that you know, the work of TLAP right there embedded in that, that vision, that this is about promoting people's well-being, it is about promoting people's independence and enabling them to be active. Um, and the second part of the vision is to transform people's experience by putting them in, in control. So, our vision for the system as a, as, a, as a department is right there, I think, embodied in what TLAP is about. We don't want to see that shifted. We want to see that, that developed and, and, and move forward. I think what the Health and Social Care Bill was about when it went through Parliament was to try and free up the system, was to get that, that double devolution down from, from, from government to locality, but really importantly then from locality down to individual citizens, so that we don't see the answer as guidance, we don't see the answer as specifying how people behave, that, that is about local places and citizens in local places determining what is important to, to them. I mean, before this job I was the Director of Social Services in Wolverhampton and we then thought we did quite a good job in Wolverhampton and that was partly because the PCT chief executive I worked very closely with um, had been around a long time, was very skilled and was very experienced and was Wolverhampton like a stick of rock. So when the, the SHA told him to jump, he didn't because it, unless it was in the best interest of the people in Wolverhampton. David Nicholson even called Wolverhampton Fortress Wolverhampton at one stage. But that's it, I say that, I give you that anecdote, because that's important. I think we've got that much more now in the system and the way we work within the department. The I statements, again, TLAP being um, absolutely pivotal in developing the I statements, again, underpins um, the, the bill and underpins how we see success within the, within the new system and the reform system we're trying to. Um, trying to create. Um, the care bill is a priority and I'm not going to take you through this slide every point but I, you know you will recognise as you know what's in the, the care bill. It is our priority that we make these things real, um, that it's not just um, about changing the law but actually the world continues as, as it always has done and that is a real challenge in terms of that that, that culture change. I was in the presentation around personal health budgets before and the, um, the person presenting that said the biggest challenge really was that cultural shift. We know how to do some of this um, but it's the culture that will will move things up, uh, will really make the difference to, to people's lives. Um, Norman Lamb absolutely behind personalisation. He was in a meeting last week with Sandy Keane and Sandy said to, from Ada, Sandy said to him, what are your priorities, Norman? He gave three things, quality, integration and, and personalisation. So right at, uh, um, at the highest levels within the department of ministerial level, um, ministers looking to drive forward personalisation and, and, and Norman himself chaired the personalisation summit that we had. Um, recently, um, covered two specific um, important areas, personalisation, personal builds, budgets and commissioning and market development. We've made lots of progress in these areas but we still have a, a way to go. We, we ANS I think have done now two personal budget surveys and we've seen some councils right at the bottom of the list. I know ADAS have written to those councils but we really need to get in there and say what's happening in these places, why is the, the service not, not good enough in these, these places, we've really got to, to tackle that and again a real ministerial appetite to, um, to do that. So future priorities for, for TLAP that follow on then I think from the white paper and the uh, and the bill, first of all, continuing that, that current work programme, supporting policy programmes, tackling um, and, and, uh, and working with underperformance, engaging um, with people who use service. I think that one of the magic things about that about is, is co-production. I think you've, you've seen co-production run through the whole of today. 
supporting the bill to get things like the secondary legislation right, the statutory guidance right, being with us, being in the room with us, helping to write that, telling us what are the important points that we need to, to capture. Still a task for us in terms of mainstreaming um, <coughs> personalization in everyday practice. Um, and then following up from the personalization sur survey, really getting involved in take, taking forward the action points from the personalization survey uh, so, um, summit, building up the services, moving from the, the services to, to needs that Alex talked about, integrating health and, and social care budget. So I think a, a challenging um, agenda, but I think an agenda that TIA can absolutely deliver on. And then I find I just wanted to, to finish with, I was sort of thinking last night about this sort of presentation, I'm thinking, well, what is it that enthuses me personally about TIA? What is it about the, the behaviours that are a priority in TIA that we want to model? And I came up with a, li a little list that I think what TLAP's about is it is about values and it is about, about behaviours. Um, the whole system comes together within, within TLAP. And I think we leave our sort of parochial self-interest at the door. So from a provider perspective, it's not about money, it's not about the contract, it's not right. It's about how do we build the, the better service, and that's not always true. I think there's a suspending of, of, of disbelief that, that, that we can make things better and a real sense of, of collaboration. And I think that's then very successfully married with a sort of spirit um, of learning and a spirit of, of, of expectation. Sometimes we get it right, sometimes we don't, but we're not afraid to experiment. You in this room are not afraid to experiment. I think of you that change, we need to be adaptive when we look at change. There are, um, you know, it's not a book on the shelf where we can find the answer. It's not about technical solutions, it's about how do we adapt to this new world we're, we're in. Um, but it's not airy-fairy, it's also around the focus on delivery and it's a focus on um, making the world different. So, you know, long may TLAP support us survive, you've certainly got the support of, of, of the department and we look forward to being partners and equal partners with you on the journey.